Chris Westshaw. Cool, so on the podcast today on The Success Recipe, we have an amazingly talented guy. He has had an amazing career, done many things. Uh, we're going to find out more about that later, but uh, today I have joining me Calvin Taylor. Brother, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. How's everything? <laughs> yeah, good, man. Yeah, good, good. How are you, uh, how are you uh, holding it down during lockdown? <laughs> coping, coping with lockdown here in New Zealand is uh, it's been pretty interesting. So um, yeah, just keeping fitness, keeping busy, um, trying to do auditions um, in a safe space. <laughs> so I have to have friends pre-record things and send it to me. So, uh, but yeah, other than that, uh, it's been I can't complain, man. I'm grateful. I think everyone was a, a bit on a treadmill, so it's a bit of a break, and everyone needed it for sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you're originally from the States and a lot of questions about that sort of dynamic as well. And there's there's a, a plenty to talk about with your career as well. But obviously, you just said like, you know, we're in lockdown here in New Zealand. Um, what's your what's your thoughts and feelings about how kind of we're dealing with the pandemic? And obviously, back in America, everyone's out enjoying their summer. Um, got their their freedoms and everything like that. Like, how, how have you personally felt about having to go through lockdown here? Uh, I think the lockdown here has, has been uh, handled as, as best as it possibly can, to be honest. Um, I feel like America is sort of like a, a controlled plane crash. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's going down, but it's still like somewhat controlled. So it's just like chaos in the middle of everything. But... I feel like uh, New Zealand's doing things as as ethically as possible. I, w- I would say to try to curb the the spread of the uh, the virus. So yeah, so I, I think I think they're doing the best they can. I, that that's all my assessment on it, and I think I think they're doing a, a pretty decent job regarding that. Yeah, I I lived over there for five years myself, and and recently moved back to New Zealand. But like, I got a lot of friends over there still, and kind of. You know, they, they talk to me about how we're doing with it and stuff. And yeah, I, th- I think it's interesting. And and one thing I would, I would at least say is that, like, I'm glad to be back home during a crazy time like this. Like, there's nothing like kind of being home and close to loved ones and family and stuff. So, um, like, do you have a lot of, is the majority of your family and friends still over in the States? Yeah, majority of family is in the States. And, you know, they're coping with it the best they can. Uh, my Most of my family is, like, scattered around. I got family in Virginia Beach, New York. Uh, my, ho- my hometown's Virginia Beach, but got family there. Um, and, yeah, so family's just kind of scattered around. But I would say that they're doing the best they can. Most of them have panicked because of the, the news, went straight and got vaccines because of the news. So <laughs> it's... It's it's interesting. Oh, in America, it doesn't it doesn't take much to get people to do something. You just put it on Fox or MSNBC, and they're gonna they're gonna run and do something. So yeah. <clears throat> so what brings you to New Zealand? How long have you been here? What brought you here? Man, uh, New Zealand. I I got here in 2010, 2010, 2010. I was seeing a young lady who was from Australia, and uh, we were sort of in a relationship. And it was falling apart. And I, prior to that, I decided that me and her would try to meet each other in New Zealand. I lived uh, in Australia, actually, for two years prior. I was in Sydney, and then I moved to Perth. And I had no idea about immigration or how to, like, be able to continue a work visa. So I just, I ended up having to go back to the States. And while I was there, I told her, like, look, I think we should just, just, just go to Auckland and and see how it goes, let's just try to meet there. But um, she was going to uni and it was more cost efficient for her to stay in Australia. So we just, we both ended up parting ways for different reasons. And I just ended up here. And I ended up staying, my third day here, I got signed to a modeling agency uh, known as Red 11. And uh, I just met this model randomly off the street and she just walked by, saw me, she's like, wait, you're kind of tall. She was like, you did any modeling work before? And I was like, yeah, yeah, locally, like, but, but, you know, just within Virginia. And she said, okay, well, here, take my card, go to this agency, just look at this card, call them tomorrow. Called them, they brought me in, they signed me. So, 
Yeah, that's that's how I, I, I got here. It was actually off of love. <laughs> the premise of love. And, um, and then I found this country, which I did research on, but I didn't know too much about. You know, I just wanted to be able to touch the ground and get to meet more different Polynesian people and different Maldi people. Because I met some Polynesians and Maldis uh, while I was in Australia, in Western Australia, in Perth. And that was my first time being exposed to a lot of Polynesian culture. So I was excited to, to get here. So, yeah. <laughs> mm. And 11 years later, you're still here. Yeah, I'm still here. This, this place is it's home. It's been a, a very beautiful, very open, very safe space to be in uh, with people. You know, just it's different cultures that come here and everyone's, um, th what's interesting I feel like about New Zealand is that I feel like everyone here is not from here for the most part. <laughs> and um, it's a place still trying to find its way and trying to do things as ethically as possible um, in regards to human rights and trying to acknowledge their, their role in their past as, uh, as best as possible. And I think they've done a better job than a lot of other Western countries. <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, especially like Auckland being, yeah, yeah, and I mean, Auckland is basically the hub of that in New Zealand, so it's definitely, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely trying to evolve and, and move forward as, I guess, ethically and morally as it can. <clears throat> so, so before you uh, before you came uh, to New Zealand, were you doing a lot of acting? And you said you're doing some modeling, but had you kind of cracked it in terms of acting and stuff back back over there? What's interesting is I I was only doing modeling work uh, locally in my home state home state of Virginia. I was modeling for uh, Billionaire Boys Club, which is Pharrell Williams, his clothing brand. So um, it was more of a cross collaboration with another hip hop clothing brand called Schmack, and so. BBC, Billionaire Boys Club, and Schmack were both coming up at the same time. So Pharrell was bringing his clothing back home. This other designer was doing his clothing, and so they just paired up. And I just started mo modeling locally for them. And I did theater in, in, in high school, but I never thought I would end up acting. And what's interesting is most people look at me and they're like, you're American, so it's kind of smart that you went to New Zealand. And that's a backdoor route for you to start your career. And I was like, actually, I had no intentions of moving to New Zealand and acting. I just, I got here in that I just got signed to the modeling agency. And so from there, everything just took off. And um, the modeling agency was like, hey, you did any commercial work before? And I was like, eh, nah. And they're like, okay, we're going to put you forward for some commercials. And then they came to me and was like, hey, you ever did acting? And I was like, yeah, I did theater in high school, but I didn't think it was going to be any big deal. And um, yeah, and then from there, they were like, okay, cool, we're going to put you forward for some auditions. So my love for acting and arts really didn't start in the States. It, it started in New Zealand. And it's just my accent. It throws people off. So they hear it and they're like, oh. You, you, you did this in America, and then you came here, and I'm like, New Zealand was the place where I found what I love and that I can wake up and do every day, to be honest. But yeah, in, in the States, yeah, I did, I did some modeling gigs and things of that sort, and just local stuff, but never thought that uh, I would fall into to acting and it would be practical. Even while I was in Australia, I, I was just working at Foot Locker. <laughs> There was no, there was no modeling and acting. I was modeling prior to that, but I got to Aussie and I was just trying to like find myself. So that's, yeah, that's that's how that came about. <laughs> how has the work that you've done here kind of opened doors for you, or um, I guess impacted your recognition for roles looking to land back over in the states? Um, I think it it's opened up quite a few doors to be honest in in different ways because uh it's made my journey unique in the, in the regard that I am African American but I ended up going into New Zealand and my work started here so when people look me up and they see that my work started in New Zealand it's like they're trying to gauge that whoa you've got a different story and perspective about how all of your your career starts and beginnings came along. And I, I, I don't even like the term it as career, 
it's more of an opportunity. It's, I feel like people in art, it's, it's, especially in acting, it's, it's just an opportunity. And the fact that anyone looks at you and wants to give you an opportunity to see your value and give you a chance, I think it's a beautiful thing that they see something in you. But it's helped me uh, in, in various ways just because I've been able to hopefully <laughs> make the best of each relationship and opportunity that I've had. And I, I think I've done a good job of being grateful and appreciating anyone that I've had the opportunity to work with and leave them with the, a lasting impression that they're like, you know what, this guy, he's, he's different, you know? And I, I didn't study acting at all. Like, I... <laughs> I just sort of fell into it. I, I studied later here in New Zealand. I studied while I was in New Zealand, but it's something I totally fell into. So, you know, it's and that's what you, you have to do is jump in the pool. Just jump in, it's cold, but then eventually you figure out how to swim, move around in it. So, yeah, I hope that, that answers. <laughs> nice. You mentioned that, like, you know, meeting uh, the Polynesians and Māori uh, culture and kind of, getting to know that and stuff and in terms of I guess the the acting uh, industry here how do you feel um, I guess they're portrayed or utilized um, within the industry say compared to like you know African Americans back in the United States you know you always see the award ceremonies and sort of you know the the scrutiny around who is always getting nominated and stuff like that and you know, it's it's a very conscientious, I guess, topic and always has been and hopefully not, but it seems like it always will be, you know, race comes into it. But how do you think New Zealand kind of, um, yeah, recognises Māori and Pacifica within the acting community over here? Uh, I feel like New Zealand, they're, they're doing a good job um, representing um, Māori culture and, um, and Pākehā, um, which is European. Um, I think, I think with Polynesian culture, I think they're doing some things that are, that are great in strides, but I feel like there's still more to be done. Um, I feel like there's more to be done on a, on a vast scale as far as diversity goes. And, uh, I actually just got through writing an article, uh, that I submitted to two media companies here and I won't say their names cause I don't, I don't want to bash them or anything of that sort. But the subject matter was based upon me being, I was the first African-American male on reality TV here in New Zealand um, with my stint on Condine with me. And uh, they were the first African female that had her stint on reality TV. Her name was Ajo Chol, and she was on the very first season of New Zealand's Next Top Model in 2009. And I just looked at those two the parallel of my experience and her experience and seeing how that played out for uh, representation on a TV screen. And I'm not too sure how Ajo's doing. So I've been just always really curious about her story and just about if there, if there has been any other Africans on TV. Because there's African performers and they do want to act, they do want to perform here, but they feel like they, they're not considered Kiwi. So I, I wrote this article and um, those two media outlets um, rejected it. One of them I've actually written an article for before and they accepted that article but because it was talking about, um, and, and at my conversation, I wrapped up my, my article very nicely because it started off initially about me and Agile, but it, lead, it led into me explaining about the importance of diversity all around in a very holistic way that um, the person that controls images controls minds. And what I mean by that is when a person can start seeing them, themselves on screen, it gives them something to relate to um, from, a, um, from a very human point of view. And as a child, if you're watching a TV screen and you don't see anyone that looks like you that often, then it, it can be daunting. You know, so, and I, I was explaining that's how Fast and Furious works so well. It works so well as a franchise because <laughs> everyone can look at someone on that film and go, man, that could be me, you know? And the fact that, you know, they've, they've had a moldy actor in there recently, uh, shouts to Vinnie Bennett, you know, that played um, the young Dominic Toretto. Like, 
that in itself is is beautiful but it shows diversity works in itself but um I'm, I'm not for sure if everyone's open for that that topic so diversity i feel like is uh, a, a subject that people tend to use as it's social uh it's just for like social pr it sounds good on paper and they're i feel like they're open-minded diversity wise when it comes to sexual things sexuality affects every ethnic group but unfortunately race relations doesn't affect every ethnic group so they can kind of turn a blind eye or close their ear towards certain subjects that that might not fit well with what they want out so yeah i think it's interesting you say that because um you know in new zealand what we were the first country to give ladies the vote right but um yeah i think that the the diversity thing is that's that's still uh you know in a, in a stage of of struggle um and yeah i mean there's been some great shows you know talking about the panthers that recently came out to really you know my, my fiance she's she's british she yeah yeah my, my my fiance she's british right but she 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 wasn't aware of i guess the um the struggles that polynesians had to endure you know in the 70s and 80s like you know my my, my father and stuff and so that's only literally been brought to light recently yeah, no, the, the, what the Polynesian Panthers went through, what the Polynesian community went through with the Dawn Raids, period, that whole experience, I mean, it was beautiful um, that uh, the, the Prime Minister, uh, Jacinda Ardern, she gave that acknowledgement of the situation and that happened, and that's how a society begins to heal, is through acknowledgement, you know, um, when there's no acknowledgement, you know, there's no change, because the person's not willing to admit there's a problem, so... Um, just a slight, slight compare real quick. Um, it's like the situation in America where America had a role in, you know, the human trafficking of Africans and bringing Africans to America or even genocide of Native Americans. But there's no real acknowledgement of it. It's just something that happened and they're like, okay, you're here. Let's not talk about it. And so when you kick crumbs underneath the carpet, it starts molding and smelling. And so what happened is this people keep complaining and upset that race relations keep being brought up but it's like you never sorted your mess you took your mess and you kicked it underneath the carpet and it's like no you've got to you've got to clean it and the way to clean it is is to have acknowledgement so the fact that new zealand has had acknowledgement here regarding that um even next door in australia with um the aborigines people you know the fact that there was an acknowledgement i know there was an olympic year around that so I don't know if that was PR, <laughs> but um, but the fact that there was an acknowledgement of, of some sort, that's that's how society begins to heal. They start to have a consciousness about how they deal with other ethnic groups and other people and be mindful that uh, th these people have been through a fair bit. So yeah, the, the Polynesian Panther story, the, the whole story of what Pacifica has been through here in New Zealand is uh, it, it's powerful. And, uh, I, and I hope, I want that program to, to make it across the board onto Netflix in the U.S. I want people in the States, African Americans, every, every culture, but specifically because it was a Black Panther, you know, chapter in New Zealand. African Americans need to hear this story. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm doing all yeah, I can. Exactly. I'm doing all I can to make sure that diversity is, is on the forefront because... People's stories need to be heard and they need to be told, and yeah. And I think I think it's important what you said about you know like it's important for for children to see themselves represented, you know, on TV on the big screen. And for me, like a, a, an amazing sort of moment in the past couple of years, um, you know, was Chadwick playing Black Panther. Like that movie was so dope, and also to see the impact that he had on you know the african-american community and young children and you know they're like we've never seen like superman is white like all these superheroes have never been of color and i mean the impact that black panther you know rest in peace like that was amazing yeah 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 totally chadwick uh and just how he handled that role just how uh chadwick yeah. has a, a certain amount of um he has this this elegance and classic. Um, he has a very classical way of performing, 
uh, that comes out that I don't see in a lot of a lot of actors. But um, but he definitely came up in a very theater background, and so he hones this sort of um, prestige. You could feel it when it when he's performing that it's coming out in a certain way that it's uh, it's regal. So they they cast the right the right actor for for Black Panther just off the fact that he has a very regal to his performance. And yeah, just being able to see that was fantastic. I think the only person that would ever have an issue with that is Wesley Snipes because he was Blade, and also probably <laughs> Michael Jai White because he was Spawn. <laughs> so they'll both contest like, wait a minute, we yeah. were the first African yeah. <laughs> superheroes. But shout exactly. to Blade, yeah. shout to Spawn. <laughs> exactly, but big love yeah. to, to Black Panther. Yeah, I think it was the African connection that, was that 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 did it, and then in this time period too, it's it's able to be marketed in, in another way. So. Mm. so you've done a lot of work, you know. I've looked through all the stuff you've done. Um, you've also obviously have quite a passion for comedy as well. So, like, what is your true passion in terms of where you wanted to take your career? Is it more of a serious role, or are you more leaning towards the comedic side of things? I I think I like being in a sandbox in general. I, I like coming in and uh, what how I what I end up realizing about about me pursuing acting and what I fell in love with was the fact that you get to play dress up every day and you get to tell stories and I'm like who wouldn't want to play dress up and just be a character? It's Halloween essentially. It's child's play, so you get to play every day and. If, someone likes the way that you play then you have an opportunity out of that to show show your your rolodex and your talents and yeah so i love i love comedy but i love any any role all around honestly i i like just being able to try to bring something to life and honor the writer in the, in the best way possible you know and uh bring some humanity to it but uh comedy comedy i absolutely adore because it, it just we need laughter. Like in times like this, what we're dealing with, everyone's trying to keep their mental health together and and stay nice and sane and stable during this lockdown and people have to deal with themselves or their spouse. <laughs> you know, and I think laughter is what saves uh, humanity all around. I think the ability to laugh about things and our differences, you know, um, that I, I feel like we're not above... Um, reproach and critique like that's how we we move ahead and even if um we we make jokes about our, our differences i i think that's what that's the beauty of everything i mean even i would say with the lgbtq community i mean ellen ellen degeneres made her career off cracking jokes on other people and joking on herself so i feel like comedy all around is a place it's a platform where people can still express themselves and it's not malicious it, it's just it's just highlighting social points that and social differences that we can observe that people see that they don't say that they can find humor in, and it might open up dialogue for deeper discussions and 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 it just i think it heals people laughter heals people so i'm all for comedy and being as a performer i just want to make people feel great I want to make people feel great. And if I can do that through comedy, great. If I can do that as being a villain and they just love me being a villain, then then fantastic. But I'm humble because I'm still I'm still on my way up, you know. And I, I think uh, that's the beauty of this journey is that it's a slow drift for me. It's been a slow drift. Yeah, nice. What do you think of the New Zealand humor? New Zealand humor. Oh, New Zealand humor, it's, it's great. It's great. It's different. It's different for sure. It's very different. Yeah, very different. Because uh, I think there's a sort of a British influence on it a little bit. You know, it's a little dry humor as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's different in a sense that I would say for, for an American, Americans they tend to like wet humor. It's just in your face, it's raw. They're just saying whatever. The most offensive thing that you would not think of, it's just very blunt. British is, um, as far as the UK goes, their humor is more of, they'll say something, it's subtle, 
but you might get it maybe two minutes later because you have to sit and think about what just happened and you're like oh now I get it so um I feel like TV comedy is a mix of both to some degree I think there's a bit of like you know sometimes it's just overt like chaos that will happen and then there is a bit of like British humor and satire that's thrown in so I think I think it's a it's a mix of both but I, I like Kiwi humor it's it's different <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's very different. Has has, has living here for the past ten years, um, sort of not confused, but like made it hard for you to kind of stay true to I guess American comedy roots, and then also like you know kind of being somewhere morph of both. Yeah. Um, no, I, I no, I think it, 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 it. I think no, I think I can I can see the difference between both of them of uh, the comedy styles and just humor, society, slang. I feel like all around what it's done is it, it opened my mind to a whole different Rolodex of just different ways that you can look at something, the perspectives of ways that you can perform something. So I think, if anything, it sort of enhanced that, that um, how I look at humor and how I look at slang and communicating. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's, it's been a, any kind of hindrance or detriment. I feel like it's been an advancement. So, and it, and that's the the beauty of living in in, in another culture is that it um, even even dating another culture, which I've I've done a lot, <laughs> my track record. But but with dating in another culture or being or living amongst another culture, it questions your ideas of what you thought was normal, what you thought was okay, what you used to think was wrong. It opens up your mind in a way that is profound, and I I love that challenge and that beauty of finding humanity in our differences, and it just makes you more wiser how you grow and how you operate. So, yeah. Yeah, because one obviously one Kiwi who's uh, you know done quite well in in terms of taking his his visions and his his ways and especially his comedy around the world is Taika Waititi and you know I've just started watching uh, Reservation Dogs I don't know if you've seen Reservation Dogs but he's still used that humor and I mean he uses humor in multiple ways you know to tell a story to evoke emotion not just humor um, but yeah that Reservation Dogs I mean that is <laughs> that's been pretty well received over in the US yeah no his his sense of humor um it's 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 transcended from New Zealand to to there, and that's what makes Kiwis very unique to Hollywood in general, is that they have a different uh, perspective in, in not just performance but just in a sense of um, in humor as well. And I think that's worked for him. It's worked for Jermaine Clement. 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 Uh, it's worked for several different actors that have transitioned from here to America, Reese Darby, anyone that has worked on any U.S. productions, um, it's, it's worked out profoundly. Yeah, it's a Taika, Taika's definitely taken uh, his humor and it, it's gone, it's flown, it's flown. Like he's got free guy right now, you know, with, with, with Ryan, you I know, know, and I'm, I'm happy for exactly. that. Exactly. I'm happy for yeah. that. Yeah, the story of those two, because they, they just, they work together on Green Lantern and they built this friendship that just transcended all of that. That was a DC property. <laughs> and now they're, you know, they're working together in, on Marvel and it, it's, they were co-actors, you know, they were, they were co-stars and now one's directing more so, one's acting, now they're back to being co-stars on Free Guy. And that's just like what it is. That's what it means to be in the industry is if you, you can build genuine relationships and connections with people and value people, it, it goes a long way. Like gratitude, humility, it grow, it goes a long way, and I'm I'm so happy for Taika, you know, from where he started, you know, um, way back at, with the Whale Rider to where he's at now. Like, I'm so thrilled about his whole story. He's such a big influence on, I would say, New Zealand culture as a whole. Just just representing and doing his best as as an adult and as a human. You know? Given the current climate, obviously with with COVID nineteen heavily impacting the world and stuff, um, and being in the the industry that you're in, what has the impact been of um, you know TikTok and Instagram? You see a lot of people who are TikTok famous. You put up one video, you get a million hits. You're done. Like, 
but you know a lot of actors and a lot of people within the industry you know they may not take that route they might go th- you know it's for the art you you study you you work hard you grind and then you see these people just do it overnight like is is it kind of evolving the way you kind of break into the industry or is there some aspect of the industry that is still like if you've if you've gone through the the trenches you know it's more beneficial than kind of getting the one and done tiktok vid type thing like what's it like at the moment going through the industry uh it is it's interesting you, you um when you'll go out for an audition which happened often in la you would go out for an audition and there would be a youtuber or a tiktoker and depending on their following they might get the gig not because of uh talent talent per se but it's the marketability of that person for the fact that they have a following uh, the tricky side to that is, is if they book someone that just has a great following, but they don't have the skill set, or they haven't taken the time to actually study in the profession that they're being hired for, then you're not going to get the most professional performer involved, or they won't even have the skill set to be able to maintain, and they might actually be a nightmare to your production, because you have to constantly critique them, monitor them, direct them, move them, you know, so... It's hit or miss, uh, and and that's what the whole influencer thing uh, about. That was like a in, massive influencer bubble. I'll say like five years ago, where everything was like, "Oh, we need an influencer. Let's get an influencer for a clothing brand, and let's <laughs> let's sell our clothes to this influencer, you know, or just give it to them, and then they'll market it." I think that's so. It's died down. Uh, social media does play a part on, in uh, in a, in a sense of social proof, and so I think um, social proof means that. People are able to acknowledge that you people, you have an audience. So I think there's pros and cons to doing uh, YouTube and TikTok and Instagram or Snapchat uh, as far as video content wise. I think it's great uh, for for performers. Uh, I think for actors, a lot of actors get involved in it once their career has gotten to a place where they can sit back and they've got leisure time. So they shoot on a show for six months, and then while they're shooting on the show, or after they're done shooting, then they do their little TikTok videos. And it's fun and entertaining for their audience. And I I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, But as far as the overnight success thing of of TikTok and Instagram, I think that that can be really great and also really tricky and damaging. And what I mean by that is it's great in the sense that you – you may get opportunities off that immediately, but then after getting this opportunity or seemingly a bit of success or fame, you can lose yourself in that equally as fast and, um, and start to not have a lot of humility because you get it so quickly. You get, it, you, get the, you get instant gratification overnight from just running around and maybe running naked on a video. You know, or doing antics, you know, and so and and also with that, it's a dangerous side too when it comes to production companies or producers that might be scoping you, because if you're willing to do anything on camera, then they're like, oh, let's just get this guy in the room and just see what else he's willing to do or, or her, you know, what they're willing to do to to be seen. Let's just put some money on the table and let's just see what they do, and I think that's very very dangerous, you know, for for performers uh, in general, so I, I I have mixed feelings about the the TikToker uh, person, um, not because of their talent, but I just hope that they're being safeguarded. And so when I said earlier that my career has been a slow drip, I mean a slow drip in the sense that I've had gigs here and there, but I haven't skyrocketed in a way where. I'm Dwayne the Rock Johnson, so, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that because that journey has humbled me in a way that I, I think if I got it very quickly, I might not have been able to know how to handle it, and I would need the right support unit of people around me to um, be able to negate and keep my mind in a in a very stable and safe place, you know, where I'm not losing myself and this idea that I'm successful, you had an opportunity and success is not 
owed to you. Some people feel like success is owed to them. I've been doing acting for 11 years, I would say, professionally. 11, 11 maybe going on 12. But I don't feel like anything's owed to me. You know, uh, it's borrowed time. Success is borrowed time. You get a highlight there. It's that 15 minutes is borrowed time. And then you have to keep going. So you have to love the when it's up. And you got to love when it's seemingly down. As long as you're active in what you do, whether it's acting, art, any any form of art is DIY. It's a lot of DIY involved. It's a lot of do-it-yourself. And it takes courage to invest in yourself. But that's what you should do if you if you want to, you know, have an opportunity is believe in yourself. And, and, and it sounds cheesy, but but if you don't believe in yourself, you know, you may end up working for someone else that believed in themselves. And they might not have much planned for you. <laughs> you might be just a, another employee on a notch. So, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with working with anyone else. You, you, that's what you have to do in life. Life is about people and co collaboration. You have to be able to collaborate with people. So you're always going to work for somebody in some degree. But what I mean by it is doing something you love, it's doing something you love that you can wake up and do every day. And invest in yourself if you if that makes you happy, you know. Um, so yeah, so, so TikToker uh, thing, I I think it's it's great. But I would just advise them, stay humble, be careful. And one good plus about that is you get to build your audience. And by building your audience, you have leverage. You do have leverage. Leverage in a sense, um, in business, that. They will, they will sign you on and you can go, okay, cool. Well, either I can work with you guys or I can just keep making money on YouTube. Like, if you don't want to hire me, I'll just keep making money on, on TikTok. And I'm cool with that. But if you want to hire me, cool. So from a business point of view, it's brilliant because you have leverage of audience, you know? Um, so And that's a great way to safeguard yourself because no one can cancel you. At, at any given moment, you only cancel yourself when you stop making videos. So, <laughs> so I think that's the. Uh, I, I I tell people no one can cancel you at the end of the day. Like as long as you can communicate, you can withstand anything. If you have communication, you can overcome anything. If you're able to communicate and keep going, and if you can keep making content, you'll survive. So. You mentioned um, earlier that you, you, you tried to write, uh, you wrote two articles, um, and then you've also mentioned in the, the information you sent through to me that you did write a piece um, for the Herald as well. So is, is writing um, also a passion of yours and something that you do um, you know, consistently in between your acting gigs, or is that kind of just something that, that popped up at the time, um, given the subject matter that you wrote about? Yeah, no, writing uh, has become a passion of mine. Um, and I, I, I gotten that passion out of uh, going through hardship when I was younger. Um, just dealing with things that put me in a position where I had to defend myself, whether that was an incident at high school with a student and I had to write the teacher, the school board. I, I've, I think uh, different people, especially if you're in of a different ethnic group and you've grown up in a Western society, you're always put in a position where you got to prove your humanity. And I would try to always improve on expressing myself and also being able to defend myself because at face value, if you're brown, you're not trusted immediately on face value. Sometimes, depending on what environment you walk into, they might look at you and be like, we're not sure about this guy. Let's keep an eye on him. You know, so because of that 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 lack of humanity, you tend to have to prove more of your worth, especially if you're a male. Especially if you're a male. You're male and you're brown, you're a target, you know. So um I tell people the only the only three things that are loved on this earth unconditionally are women, children, and animals. If you're a man, you are loved under the condition you provide something. So because of that understanding, I, I really try to take the time to talk to 
men as well to try to empower them to let them know their worth. I'm I'm not pro men's rights. I'm not pro women's rights. I'm pro human rights. And human rights, women, men, and children are all included in that. But I I do feel like men have it harder than um, a lot of other groups uh, in different ways. So everybody, I, I think, has their, their pros and cons. They have their positives or negatives. You know, a, a woman can get into a nightclub for free, you know, and the man, he's got to pay $25 at the door. So it's like, you know, they, they've got good social social things that you know women are very socially apt that they they have these advantages and sometimes it's beauty related but that's just the way it is society is sexist it 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 is on both sides so it's like what what can we do about it yeah i mean if the bouncers were females it'd probably go the other way yeah it might go the other way exactly I, i mean that that would be interesting you know but it's not me coming you're paying 20 yeah, yeah. It's not many, though, that sign up for, like, a gig, you know, to just, like, defend, you know, men that are coming in, you know? <laughs> you know, it's even in the work, workforce, it's some of the jobs, it's sort of veering off subject, but some of the jobs where women uh, will sign up to, they tend to do more jobs that are social related. Um, that's, like, nursing, social work. Um, most of some of them don't sign up for tech. Some do sign up for tech, you know, but I don't feel like there's been any real discrimination in, in opportunities in some places. I think in, in, in some environments it can be, you know, there's there's always abuse of power. We've seen abuse of power with that was on the news with Ellen and she's a lady. So it's just like abuse of power can happen on both sides. It, it doesn't matter who's. Who's in the position? But I, I think on a on a job front, I think a lot of women tend to pick jobs that are social and it's not tech or technology related per se. Maybe architecture, maybe that, maybe architecture, maybe engineering. But for the most part, a lot of jobs are social related. So it's the men and women dynamic is very interesting. But I, I feel like they've kind of got everybody quarrel, quarreling together lately. And it's, um, I think people have lost sight of, like, love and companionship. But back to your question, which is about my passion for writing. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I, I took you on the highway way off to the left, but let's veer it back, all right? We're, we're on a journey today. We're on a journey today. <laughs> Route 66. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, but back with, with writing. Uh, yeah, my love of writing just came from having to defend myself often as a, as a male and all, as a brown person. And trying to find better ways to express myself, and like I like I said earlier while we we're talking communication, if you can communicate, you can withstand the the why and how. You know, you can withstand a lot of a lot of things in life if you're able to express yourself. When you're not able to express yourself and you internalize it, then your mental health gets put at 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 risk, um, and internalizing things it it damages you from not being able to to share and talk and that's why i feel like with all subjects all around whether that's humor whether that's men and women's relations i think all levels of society um should be able to to talk and express themselves even if they're wrong express themselves i mean and and wrong is can be subjective but what i mean by wrong it, it it's like in a sense of does it sound fair does it sound balanced if you allow that person to express themselves and they have the patience and collaboration to hear you as well then you can grow out of that you can grow out of that so um but yeah writing just came from wanting to defend myself so i wrote that article for the new zealand herald which was uh, about um, about me being an African American and during Black Lives Matter in New Zealand, how that affected me, and uh, just some key points and some messages that uh, I feel like would help society as a whole and different different things that uh, affected the African American community that people might not have been privy to, but it affects all ethnic groups all around uh, in terms of colorism with the, uh, the the color black and uh what that what that means and where it came from its origins a lot of people have no idea about the origins of how did people start calling each other black and white 
it's just something people are just born into, and we do, but it's only between certain ethnic groups. You know, you never find someone that's Asian that will say, as a yellow person, I feel this. They don't identify themselves as such. They, 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 they never would. And uh, something recently that happened, the Stop Asian Hate situation, where there was a shooting in Atlanta and in the States where a guy went into a, apparently a massage parlor and shot up the, the entire massage parlor, apparently, and killed quite a few Asian women that were working, working at the parlor. Um, there was the campaign for Stop Asian Hate, and people were very interested in, in watching the situation because they were wondering why there wasn't much pushback on Stop Asian Hate, but there was pushback on Black Lives Matter. And what I, what I found interesting is that what people weren't recognizing is that people can humanize the word Asian. They, they can recognize that. They can humanize it. A color they can't humanize because it's a color. It sounds like it's a subgroup. And it sounds like you're saying your group of color is better than someone else's group of color. So a lot of the, the issues surrounding um, race relations and, and the resistance against equality or diversity when it comes to race relations is largely tied up in terminology of saying your group is better than someone else's group. And that's not really what you're saying. What you're saying is Africans are being killed in the States. That's it. But because you're not saying the word African and you're using the color code, it, it puts people at an edge where they're like, oh, what, what do you mean? What do you, are you saying your group is exceptional? Like, grief is universal. You're not exceptional. So, um, so yeah, so I was just explaining that, that between that and there not being an acknowledgement, as in, like, what happened with the Dawn Raids. America doesn't have any acknowledgement of its past, so it keeps people in the cycle of fighting and arguing. It'll go away for a bit. You won't hear anything about a shooting. Trust me. Like clockwork, it'll probably be another shooting in another month. And it'll be this huge outrage. And then it'll be a protest behind it. And as long as they're yelling and screaming at each other, we're not really coming to a true resolve, then we can keep them at bay and make money off them. That's part of what the new article that I wrote that was getting a lot of resistance was about. It was about... Um, the fact that division, there's profit in division, there's profit in outrage, and there's no true resolve being found, whether people are fighting between genders, about men and women, whether there's people fighting about race relations, um, people fighting about LGBTQ, people fighting about COVID vaccines. They knew with COVID vaccines, what would happen on a society front? They knew half the population would probably get vaccinated. The other half would spend time not sure about it, arguing. And so my article, <laughs> my article highlighted that. So I'm like, oh, I think I might have said too much, but I don't necessarily care. I don't, I don't feel like nothing can stop what is meant for me, my journey and my career and my opportunity. I care more about humanity, um, human kind, human and kind, put that together. That's all I care about. Um, and it's, it's things that are bigger than me. And that's, that's what I feel like is impactful. Um, is, is, is I think early in life, things are about you when you're younger. And I tell people your first name is for you. But as you get older, your last name is what's going to hold, hold its weight. That's, that's going to be what you're going to be remembered by is your last name. And what, what are you leaving people behind? So I find myself at, at, a, at a point where I just, I, I just really care for, for people, uh, humankind, that they, they get these understandings that how society works in, in different ways. And there is a lot of money being made. Whenever there's a protest or there's some sort of outrage, a corporation will co-op that social movement, whether it's you know, um, stop Asian hate, or if it's Black Lives Matter, they'll co-op it and go, we can make money off this. All right, let's get us an uh, African, and let's put him in the show. Let's get us an Asian. Yep, yep. He's going to be the new lead. He's the new lead in the film. And it's great. That works for my career and my industry. But Nike will do it. Toyota will do it. And it's all of this to get some, some sort of social gain. It's not... It's not genuine. It's not 
uh, I, I can't say it's 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 actually generosity. It's disingenuous, and in a lot of different ways. That that's the time they're like, oh, let's let's put let's put an LGBTQ person here. Let's make him the lead. It's like, why weren't you doing that all along? Like. Just tell good stories and, and, and be genuine. Don't put people in films for like social checkpoints because you're hoping people are going to watch it and it's hip now. We got a hip-hop song on it. Hip-hop's popular right now, so let's get some beats and drums, you know? Things like that, I'm surprised a lot of society cannot spot. I spot it and I look at it and I'm like, oh, this is cringe. Why are they doing this? It's like make a genuine good purpose and story and let it come from the heart. Just put people in there for the right reasons. But that's what goes on. And so as long as people are fighting, you know, someone's making money off of it. And I just wanted people to understand that, you know, you have to spot the bigger picture of what's going on here. Is that someone is profiting off you guys fighting at the end of the day. So as long as people can't galvanize to see that, they can't come together to see they're being played by greedy people. These greedy people that are up here in the top of their buildings, they're making money. It's like, leave them all yelling and fighting at the bottom. As long as they're screaming and yelling at each other and not at us, we're good. 23 genders, let's let them fight with each other. Yay, more splits. You know, so I, 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 I really want people to get back to the fundamentals and foundations of of society and love and everyone should be able to love whoever they, they want to love but to not keep dividing each other up into into separate entities and and then it becomes about your subgroup and so you're not really fighting for human rights you're fighting for your own group whether you're being i, I call it being too ist too ist whether you're the too uh communist or feminist or i don't know ist if you you're too far left you become a robot. You lose your humanity. You don't start seeing things on a very leveled, human way. And, you know, that can come out of victimization. And I tell people grief is, grief is universal. Grief is universal. And, and, and not to say that your grief doesn't, does, it doesn't account for, but we're all going through something. So you have to try to think about everybody when you're getting your message across. You, you try to think about what everyone is going through. It's not just about your people or yourself and you got a flat tire. You could have a flat tire. I, like, I, I could have a flat tire right now, I have no idea. But if I go outside and I have a flat tire, do I need to go take the rest of my day and be in a mood with other people? And the, the answer is no, because someone next door probably just lost their grandfather. Someone else, across the hall may not know how they're going to pay their rent, you know, so I'm saying across the hall because I'm in an apartment right now, so <laughs> give away my location, don't find me <laughs> it's going to run off camera <laughs> but, um, yeah, so a... uh, yeah, nice um, so a huge influence obviously with, with, with where you've come from and obviously you know, in your younger younger life as well um as someone who's traveled and, and lived overseas you know i did it for five years in the states you know it was my mid-20s and for me it was a very um you know transformative time you know basically when you're on the other side of the world and you don't have family and friends close by like you're, you're in survival mode and you learn you learn about not just the world and other cultures like you said and other people and and dating other cultures and understanding that but like you learn a lot about yourself as well and you learn how to survive so being here for 11 years like what do you feel like you've learned that you maybe would not have learned or experienced had you just stayed and still been in the u.s right now like what has traveling and living abroad given you I, i've learned to understand that we're all going through similar struggles and no matter where we are geographically on earth. And what I mean by that is you'll meet people here in Auckland that are concerned about how they're going to pay their rent. And maybe they don't like some things that are going on with like some policies maybe in the government or they feel like their people aren't being fully acknowledged and you know or they feel like their community is being shoved off into like one corner 
of the city and they they put a liquor store there they put a church there and put fast food there and it's like as long as there's liquor stores churches fast food we've got them off into their own world but um it's just understanding everyone's going through um that they have the same concerns it's, it's finding your humanity in all of this and that that's what i started to realize is that everyone's struggles are exactly the same it doesn't matter where they are they're concerned about safety being able to feed their family um being able to have warmth you know um and and being good 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 housing you know um because there's a fair bit of um housing issues that have happened uh throughout auckland and with people trying to stay warm during the winter and not be sleeping in someone's garage or in their car um, but these things happen everywhere, you know, uh, even in LA, uh, I've, I've been in that position as an actor where I was, I, I went to Los Angeles and I didn't have a plan. So I ended up sleeping in my car, you know, and I've seen, I just, I knew it was my, my time to go to LA. I said, I just, I have to do it at some point. I need to just go. And I just went, you know, but no one ever knew that. Because I was so clean and I, I I took care of myself so well that it wasn't it wasn't noticeable and that that's almost like a rite of passage for most actors. There's a lot of actors that were couch surfing, homeless, sleeping in a car before their career took off. You'll hear that very often, especially L.A. because L.A. is expensive. But what in New Zealand and and being here, I just found out everyone's struggles are the same, and it it put me in perspective to know that. What I thought I knew about the world and being in America. Nice. And uh, have you been able to get on board with the Kiwi sport, rugby and, and cricket? Or are you still uh, do you still follow NBA, NFL, or you know the sports back home? I I like sports in general, but like I, I haven't been able to follow any any sports really, uh, just because. I feel like I've been down in the trenches, like trying to stay active with like building with with my opportunities that may come my way and, and, and creating opportunities. And that's the cool thing about being an artist is that you get to create opportunities and meet people and collaborate. So your collaboration skills is, is, is what matters with everything. What can you, what value can you bring to somebody else's life more than just about your life and your career and stuff. Same with relationships. Back to relationships again. <laughs> it's it's not your independence. It's it's your collaboration that matters. It's how can how good are you working with people, and and, and that's what determines value in in, in a sense because life is about people. It's it's bigger than than uh than me and my and me 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 me. Because you'll find out very quickly no one likes you when you talk about me 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 me. <laughs> but yeah so um so yeah but i, I follow uh, some sport i i think um i i don't understand rugby fully i'm still watching it but i don't understand it fully i went to the nrl nines like several years ago and that was a great experience i was i was humbled someone invited me up to to the box so i got to sit up there at the top Nice. But I, I think with sport, sports is one of those things where you, you don't need to know the rules of everything. You just, you, you'll fall in love with it off the energy and the fact that everyone's chanting and they're rooting and they're excited, you know, for, for whatever color team they're going for or whatever, you know, whatever team they're excited, they're just going for it. And that in itself, that human bonding connection which is kind of missing right now because of COVID, but, <laughs> but uh, that human connection with everyone being together, that's the, where the excitement comes from. So I still need to learn more about rugby, footy over in Aussie, uh, cricket here. Yeah. I, I still need to learn more about it, but I, I will in due time. I will in due time. I'm, I'm sure of it. I'm sure because it's a big staple, big staple here. Yeah. I mean, one thing I'll say is that, you know, I got to go to – to NBA games, you know, baseball and stuff like that. And I mean, I mean, unreal. Like you guys do it big, like massive stadiums. So, I mean, I, you know, I was, I was blown away. I, I enjoyed that, man. Sports, sports over there is, is done right. Like here it's cool, but like, you know, there's no real sort of, you know, over there it's kind of similar to like, hey, you see football in, in, in the UK, you know, like you literally 
two supporters from the different teams cannot be next to each other. Like, they'll literally kill each other. Whereas here, it's just like, oh, you support Australia? Nah. It's just, you, you can just see, you can, co- you can coexist. And, you know, that's nice. But to have that rivalry and, like, the... Yeah, exactly. But, you know, when the, the rival team comes through and you're just hurling sort of, you know abuse at the players and they, it's just part of it you know <laughs> they just take it i don't know why but they just they, they accept it <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's that yeah that's that's america in the uk i mean new zealand is very community minded they're very community minded I, I think that's a beautiful thing to not go too far left for a group for your subgroup and then lose your humanity but that in the divided states that's why i call it in the divided states, it happens there all the time, and obviously in Europe, you know, they have their own issues being on borders and stuff like that, and so yeah, they really take their sport to the next level. I mean, but that passion is, it's admirable, you know, so. Uh, mm. It was, it was, it was interesting, because I was playing rugby over there, so, um, and, and the Americans, obviously, yeah, yeah, so I was playing, and, and, and we would obviously go to different states and stuff, and to experience americans i guess uh, adopting the uh, you know the ethos or you know the the general uh you know the the down ethics of rugby is just like on the field you, you want to kill a man but after that you'll actually go to the pub and have a drink with them like and the americans they're like man it's such a it's such a gentleman's game like you'll literally want to kill you on the field but as soon as the whistle blows like your best friends like you, you share your life experiences and stuff like that and so as a culture for me you know for me the culture of rugby being transported around the world like for me that was pretty deep because i also in a past life i was a dancer as well so i did a lot of research into break dancing and hip-hop culture and and hip-hop as a culture yeah so hip-hop dance and where that came from similar to rugby like it doesn't matter what your skin color is if you break dance like the language you speak is dance and so to have that with rugby as well, it was like, they didn't care who you were. Like, you played rugby, so you were a rugby player. And and, and that was the culture. And it's the same as hip-hop culture and, and breaking, you know. You're a b-boy, you're a b-girl. The language you speak is dance. And, you know, the arts and sports can be powerful like that. Like, that's that's how the rest of the world should see humanity. Like, there's no division. Like, you, you break, you have a battle, three rounds, I'm going to kill you, but then... Afterwards. After that? Nothing. Dap up. Respect. Exactly. 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 Man, that, that must have been interesting. You played rugby in the States like that. Like, which part were, of the States were you in? <clears throat> so I was, living in, um, I was living in Boston for five years. So, yeah, inter- interesting place to live. Interesting place to live in the north, northeast. But, um, yeah, th- obviously through rugby... Um, you know, had a lot of different cultures coming through. I mean, there are a lot of Irish. I actually met a lot of other Kiwi guys who would come through, a lot of Australians, South Africans, um, and then a lot of Af- African Americans as well. And, you know, people say what they, you know, they have their opinions about Massachusetts and Boston, but when, it, like I said, within the rugby, within the rugby, that didn't exist, you know, which was good for us outsiders, us non Americans. And, um, and you know a lot of people you know talked about the the mass holes and stuff like that and i just said and you might feel the same here like honestly i had an accent so i was foreign like people just love me like yeah they do people didn't hate me yeah in the states you're you're gold like you've got a different accent and you're you're from somewhere else you're absolute gold you'll pick up Whoever you it was, want, you know. It was money. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're a ladies' man, you're gonna get ladies all day with that accent. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the the only sort of confusion I would get regularly is, you know, when I hopped in an Uber, I'm somewhat bronze, and if I had a bit of facial hair, they would say, you know, Espanol, and I'd be like, no. So you know, that 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 was the only issues I had. <laughs> man, that's that's cool though, like. That's what I'm saying. That's the beauty of New Zealand is, is people being looking ethnically ambiguous too. There's a, a lot of Kiwis that, you know, just even being moldy. I think when moldies go to the states, people don't recognize that they're moldy, so they'll assume that they're like Latin American or they're from somewhere else in South America. And 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 yeah, that's 
Cliff Curtis, like as an actor, that guy, you know, he played yep. every, every <laughs> ethnic group, you know, and and, uh, and, and he he's covered all the bases. Yeah, he's covered all bases before any kind of outrage. So <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's yeah. <laughs> But, it, but but having that is 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 beautiful, and you're you you being different, and you having your culture and your perspective and everything. That's beautiful to have being to bring over to the states. And I never thought about uh, rugby being how it's conducted, being more of like a gentleman's type type sport, you know. And uh, just you explaining that to me just gave me so much more admiration for rugby. Just in general, and in, in how they yeah. how they go about the culture, and, and they play the games, and then after that, we're bros. You know, there's no real extreme rivalries. Yeah. Most sports sports groups, yeah. there's extreme like rivalries. Like you, you know, it's like ah, I don't like those guys that play for, you know, that team or whatever. Like New Yorkers don't like people from Boston. You know, so it's like exactly it's extreme. Yeah. It's extreme. My fam- most of my family's from New York. They're all, they're all from NYC. So from all over, from Bronx to Manhattan. So yeah, you mentioned somebody from Boston, they're like ah, that racist man. <laughs> it's yeah, like, an Irish and that's Irish. and you. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and, and that was funny. We'd play rugby against you know teams from New York, and same thing. Like you know, we're like, oh, there's the Boston New York rivalry, but then after the game, that's amazing. We're having pints together. Like it's different. It's different. And you wouldn't see that you you wouldn't see the Yankees having a having a drink with the Red Sox or, you know, vice versa, Knicks, Celtics. That would not happen. No, not at all. Not at all, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. That must have been a great experience. Hey, um, just a just a random question, like, how did you come across my podcast? Oh, I came across your podcast. Um just I I listened to bits and pieces of your podcast uh, with my friend Lucina. Um, I, I don't, I don't know, oh, if you right. know Lucina. She was uh, the New Zealand's um, first female bachelorette. Yeah, they they kind of paired her yeah. up with a brown girl and a blonde girl. I, I till this day, <laughs> I'm like, what was that? I like, could could we just let one person yeah. have their their shine? But I felt like. That was New Zealand being like, well, we don't know about diversity, how it's going to work, so let's put them together, because we don't. Yeah. And I, yeah, they need to do better. <laughs> they need to do better. But, you know, she ended up being on there. Exactly. Yeah, but she, she ended up being on there, and um, and me and her, we met prior. We, we went to, I, I told you I studied acting here in New Zealand. We studied with the same acting coach, me and her. We went to, we studied with an oh, acting nice. coach named Michael Sassenti. He's uh, an American Sicilian. He's he's Italian, but from New York. Moved to New Zealand 25 years ago, I think, because of marriage. And he just stayed here, and he's been teaching acting ever since. And he's taught some big Kiwi actors. Uh, Anthony Starr and uh, Carl Urban are two of his uh, actors that he's worked with, uh, that I would say probably even protégés. But those are the top two actors he's worked with here, and they're both on The Boys, the Amazon TV show. It's a superhero TV show. It's real brutal yeah. and violent and bloody. They're the two leads on it. It's the number one show on Amazon. It's a superhero show. So, um, but yeah, me and Lucina, we studied with him. And I ended up getting a music video gig. I got here into the music video gig. And we just stayed in touch uh, ever since. Man, she's gorgeous. Beautiful lady. Very beautiful lady. You know, she, and she's a doctor. You know, she's a doctor as well, too. So it's like... She can break your heart and fix it all at once. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I discovered your podcast through through Lucina. I actually didn't I didn't tell her. I just like I went and I was just going through different things. I was just checking up on people, seeing how they're doing. I came across the fact that you did a podcast with her. I was like, man, this is this is really cool. You know that she's sharing her story and her journey a bit. And you guys were both talking as well about about life, and I, I I was interested in wanting to find a way that I could get on a podcast and be able to just to share something more than just about my career as a part of it, but like the human aspect of things that can help people in society. So I was like, yeah, I, I wanted to reach out to you and 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 uh, and, and do a podcast with and, and 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 just be able to provide something locally. You know, we don't know how. How vast this the market is. I mean, uh, your podcast might get 
I mean, it's global, so you someone else may listen to it in Singapore. You know, you you never know where someone's gonna listen to it. But it's just about getting out good messages. That's the beauty of the what, what we live in, which I, I call the age of um, sharing. We live in the age of sharing. Where back in the day, we couldn't do this on our own. We thought we would need probably like five thousand dollars worth, you know, or, or five thousand, probably fifty grand worth of equipment to be able to sit here and talk to each other. We probably did. I don't know. But, <laughs> but the fact that yeah, but the fact that we can go on YouTube now and generation, you know, I also call it generation search. If you can mine information, you're a very powerful person. Like you're resourceful. You're resourceful at finding stuff and not giving up. And um, this young generation, that's what they're good at. They're good at searching, looking up information. Hopefully, if they're you know if they're interested in it, but trying to read deeper into things. But if they want to do something, they'll go and figure out how to do it. Where older generations will just look at that computer. And like, I don't know about that thing. Technology. Scared of that thing. No. Well. We gotta press a button. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so but that's yeah, that's that's how I, I came across you. It's it's just the fact that you know you're, oh. you're we're able to share things and this is beautiful. This is beautiful and thank you. Mm. I'm I'm grateful oh, you, nice, man. you've got me on. <laughs> That's cool. I'm glad that you were able to, to kind of find my podcast. And um, it's funny because Lucina is a small world is Cam's cousin. And like after I had her on my podcast, he was like, oh, that was my cousin. And then he did a did a um, episode with her, too. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that would have been good fun just to bounce off two different people. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but yeah, small world. So, um yeah, that's that's what I was asking about the about the about the sport too, because um, we we try and talk about American sports. So you know, if you did ever want to jump in and have a have a chat about you know just some sports, you know, we can do that. Yeah, I'm I'm tr- I'm trying to keep up on things, man, as as much as I can. I think I'm 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 more up on whatever's happening in UFC and boxing, probably more so than anything. Well, that's good. You know, it's you know technically it's American sports, so. Yeah, I'm watching hip hop battles too. I'm watching the versus thing, so I'm watching Jadakiss, you know, nice. battling with you know Dipset, and so I'm, I'm watching things here and there. But uh, yeah, definitely, man, I would be keen on sitting around and, and talking, ch- chatting up some sports, and and seeing uh seeing what's the haps <laughs> for sure. <laughs> nice, man. Well, yeah, really appreciate you uh, taking some time to to have a chat today. Was there anything else you kind of wanted to? Uh... To, to talk about before we kind of wrap things up no no nothing off top man i i think i'm i've, I've said a, a lot of gyms here and there that i felt like i wanted to try to oh, get out and it just sort of happened naturally in the conversation so i'm i'm just grateful to to be able to talk to you man and 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 just have the privilege of being able to speak and salutes to you for you taking a chance on yourself doing this podcast you know and 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 just creating something Everybody starts from just doing something, just trying, you know. So, starting, to, yeah, yeah. So, I, I think I froze up for a second there. Yeah. Like, stuck like that for like ten seconds. Still good. Still good. <laughs> yeah. No, I, pre- I, pre- I appreciate you reaching out. Uh, thank you, man. I was gonna start the podcast with me frozen. I was just gonna be like this and see if you'll catch it. <laughs> like I think we lost him. <laughs> He's just. <laughs> yeah man well we'll definitely um maybe we'll tee up another another episode soon you know who, who knows how long we could be in lockdown so you know have some more gems to to drop world is uncertain right now for sure <laughs> love to love to thank you so much man thank awesome brother. thank you very much man thank you thank you all right brother peace peace <laughs>